Welcome to another discussion on mixture. Today, we're going to focus on the different ways on how we can separate the components of different mixtures. But first, there are different factors that we have to consider in choosing the best method in separating the components of the mixtures. First is the size of the dispersed particle of true solution, colloid, and suspension. Second is the density of components, which is lighter and which is heavier. Third, boiling point, which will boil faster. And the last, freezing point, which will freeze faster. Not all kinds of separation method will apply to all kinds of mixtures. That is because they have different particle sizes. The component of suspension are easier to separate since they have the larger particle size. This yummy dish is called pakbet. How do you call this in your place? This is an example of suspension. Its chunky ingredients can be separated by hand picking. Some would only choose the vegetable that they love and leave out the vegetables that they don't like. But look at all these insects and stones. We can help clean the rice by picking them before cooking the rice. Do you remember this experiment? In this experiment, we've proven that suspension is unstable and shows settlement of heavier particles. They are called sediments. When these sediments are settled down at the bottom of the container, we can now separate the liquid part of the mixture from the solid part. This process or method of separation is called decantation. One example of decantation is when you rinse the rice before you cook them. We can also use decantation in trying to separate oil from water. Oil and water have different densities. Oil is lighter or less dense while water is heavier or denser. That's why these two won't. If you leave the mixture for some time, oil and water will form two layers. You can pour out the oil and leave the water, or you can also freeze the oil. Put ice cubes or put the mixture in the refrigerator to freeze the oil and then scoop out the oil. Another method of separating mixture is sieving. A sieve is used to separate large particles from smaller particles. In the kitchen, it is used in sifting flour. In construction, it is used in separating the small rocks from fine sands. In our previous experiment, we were able to recover the iron filings from the mixture of sulfur and iron. This is by the use of magnet. Magnetizing is very helpful, especially if you want to recover elements which are metal from the mixture. Another way of separating mixture is by the use of a separating funnel. A separating funnel is used to separate two immiscible liquids. They are immiscible because they have different densities. Oil and water have different densities because oil is lighter and water is denser or heavier. After the two mixtures are placed inside the funnel, they are shaken well and the pressure is released from the funnel. The stopper is opened to release the heavier liquid into a clean beaker, and it, it will be closed before the oil comes out. Another beaker is used to recover the oil. And now, oil and water are separated. In our previous experiments, we've seen how the components of suspension were separated by filtration. Here, we have recovered filtrate in the test tube, while residue are the substance that remained in the filter paper. Let us find out which method will best apply in separating the components of true solutions. Again, 
True solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. It has two components, the solvent, which is present in larger amount, and the solute is the component present in smaller quantity. The components of true solution can be separated by simple distillation. In this setup, the mixture is placed inside the 250 RP flask and it will be heated using a heating mantle. The temperature is set depending on the boiling point of the liquid we want to recover. Once the liquid boils, it will evaporate and pass a condenser. The condensing liquid will then be collected in another RP flask. We will watch how acetone is recovered from acetone and water mixture by simple distillation. Here, the heating mantle is set to 56 degrees Celsius because acetone boils at 56 degrees Celsius. While the temperature rises to 56 degrees Celsius, acetone boils and evaporates and will be condensed and the condensed acetone will be recovered in another RB flask while the water remains in another RB flask. To separate the components of true solutions with two or more miscible liquids and different boiling points, we are going to use fractional distillation. This is also the same with the simple distillation. The difference is that a fractionating column is fitted between the distillation flask and the condenser. A simple fractionating column is tube packed with glass beads. These beads provide surface for the vapors to cool and condense repeatedly. When vapors of a mixture are placed through the fractionating column, because of the repeated condensation and evaporation, the vapors of the liquid with the lower boiling point first pass out the fractionating column, condense, and are collected in a receiver flask. Let us watch how ethanol and methanol is recovered from the mixture using fractional distillation. In fractional distillation, the heating mantle is set to 65 degrees Celsius because methanol will boil at 65 degrees Celsius. As it boils, it will evaporate, pass through a fractional column, condense, and will be recovered in a receiver flask. Once we've recovered the methanol, we will put another RP flask to recover another liquid with another boiling point. The temperature is set, set to 78 degrees Celsius for the ethanol to boil. Using the same procedure, we now have the ethanol. That is how we recover the methanol and ethanol by fractional distillation. The components of true solutions can also be recovered or retrieved by crystallization. Let us find out how copper sulfate is retrieved from the mixture using this process. First, we are going to filter the mixture so that the insoluble components of the mixture will remain as residue in the filter paper and we will have a clear filtrate. Hit the filtrate on the dish using a sand bath. Continue stirring so that the sediments will not form up at the bottom of the dish. Reduce the liquid to one-third. And check if there are crystals on the steering rod. Transfer the mixture in the crystallizing dish. And put it in cold water. You will now see that the crystals are forming after 30 minutes.
rinse the crystals. And dry. We are now able to retrieve copper sulfate crystals. Another separating technique used to separate the components of liquid mixture is by paper chromatography. Paper chromatography is one of the important chromatographic methods. Paper chromatography uses paper as the stationary phase and a liquid solvent as the mobile phase. Let us watch how it is done. A capillary tube is used to get the mixture and the sample is placed on the spot of the paper. A mixture of water and alcohol will be prepared and put inside the chromatography chamber. The mixture of alcohol and water will serve as the solvent. The paper is carefully dipped into the solvent inside the chromatography chamber. After 30 minutes, the solvent rises up the paper due to capillary action and the components of the mixture rise up at different rates and thus are separated from one another. Let us discuss the last separation technique, which is centrifugation. This is used for mixtures which has a component that cannot be separated by filtration. This is done in a centrifuge machine. Let us see how the components of milk are separated using a centrifuge machine. We can now see that the solid component of milk is separated from its liquid component. Thank you for watching. That's it for this video. If you learned something here, don't forget to like and subscribe to Cup of Teach. See you on the next lesson. Bye!